thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about Pick My Project, Lessons Learned from Interviewing 20 End Users for Cloud Native Case Studies. And this is kind of a talk about my experience building and growing the Cilium Project community, which is one of the fastest moving projects in the CNCF ecosystem. So no CNCF or KubeCon talk would be complete without having a picture of the cloud native landscape, right? There's hundreds, probably almost a thousand different projects that you could think about, including into your cloud native stack. And why would you choose a single one or why would you choose any of them? That's actually what I'm gonna be trying to answer for you today. And Cilium finds itself in the networking space. And you can see even in this smaller sp slice of the cloud native landscape, there's a lot of choices there. But Cilium has actually become one of the most popular projects, not only in the networking space, but actually in the whole CNCF ecosystem. In fact, it just reached 20,000 GitHub stars, you know, with this great vanity metric. A lot of people have clicked a button on GitHub. But that doesn't actually speak to what people are actually using. I think a better indication of the use and popularity of Cilium is actually in the people that have publicly said, yes, I'm using Cilium, I'm using it in production, it's running my mission critical applications on Kubernetes, and I trust it to make my business money. And I'm really proud that we have 153 companies that have publicly said, yes, I'm using Cilium in my Kubernetes clusters, and of those, 74 have stories about how they're actually doing that. So that may take the case of a blog post, a conference talk, or a written case study. So this is the actual social proof behind those GitHub stars. They actually mean something to people are using Cilium in production. And so the question we're trying to answer is what causes end users to choose a cloud native project? And I'm gonna talk from my experience uh, of the Cilium project, right? And so the first thing, maybe when you're looking at a GitHub project uh, or an open source project is to go to GitHub and go to the readme, right? And here projects can say whatever they want to. There's a lot of great marketing terms in here, like almost unlimited scale, deep visibility, highly efficient and flexible, right? A lot of great things that the project promises to do. But what does it actually mean in practice and why would you still choose that project? I mean, you can write whatever you want. So I'm gonna give away the end of the talk now and say that the reason why end users actually choose a project because they're trying to solve a specific need or challenge that their organization has. And that's the reason your project is actually going to get adoption. And based on my experience uh, doing case studies for Cilium, let's kind of use that as a lens for driving adoption and why the, how this might also apply to your project. So Cilium has 23 different case studies with the CNCF in a wide variety of companies, in a wide variety of industry verticals, from telecommunications to media to financial services, all trying to solve different things. And I really like these as a lens for choosing, uh, understanding how uh, people actually choose projects because of the structure. We first start with the challenge that the organization has, then we move on to the solution, in this case it's Cilium, and then talk about the impact that, that it has. And so as I've gone through and interviewed and talked with all these companies, these are really the themes that have come out and stuck out to me, right? The top reasons that people choose Cilium is performance or scalability, network policy, simplifying their networking stack, self-service automation, encryption, observability, multi-cluster, and a richer feature set. Now I'm gonna walk through each of these one by one to talk about the specific challenge that the business had and then how they use Cilium to overcome it. So that hopefully you can understand why having a specific need or challenge that the organization is gonna try to overcome is actually driving adoption of the project. So on the performance and scalability side, Trendall is a uh, consumer brand um, in Turkey and they were having problems scaling to demand that they had from their customers. And so they needed a more scalable solution to run their network. Right? And they started by testing out Cilium and compared it to other solutions in the networking space. Right? The big challenge that they had was keeping up with customer demand right, to be able to make the business money. And when testing out Cilium, they found that they could have a 40% increase in performance of their network. Right? And so even 
as the cluster traffic surged, the performance remained steady, right? So they had a problem with performance, and Cilium helped them solve that, and that's why they chose Cilium. Similarly, Cessnem, um, who is a um, internet company uh, based in the Czech Republic, um, they were having a lot of problems with like load balancing, right? They were also receiving a lot of traffic um, from their users on their, on their website, delivering a lot of news and other content, and they needed to be able to scale to meet that demand, right? And it was very expensive for them to do load balancing in first F5 load balancers, and then trying to do it in software with IPVS. And by switching to Cilium, they were able to save, reduce the amount of CPU that they needed in their clusters by 72x, right? So that actually saved them a lot of money, right? And so instead of scaling through money, they were able to scale through better software, right? So the challenge that their business had is that it was consuming too much money to be able to serve their customers, and so they needed a more efficient way to do that, and Cilium helped them do that. The next one is from Bloomberg around network policy. So, right, Bloomberg has a lot of sensitive financial data, and they want to be able to keep it secure for their customers. And the way that they're able to do that is with Cilium's network policies. And this allows them to do micro-segmentation of their network um, or zero-trust security so that customers can't access other ones' data or try to exfiltrate um, data that they're not supposed to, right? So, with the host-based network policies, they were able to implement new functionality, right? And this even actually allowed them to offer new features to their customer, right? So they chose Cilium because they needed to lock down their network. And because of what Cilium was able to offer them, they were able to actually even offer additional features to their customers, right? So driving adoption by solving this specific challenge and then meeting additional needs as they came along too. In terms of simplifying the stack, uh, Sys11 is a managed cloud provider uh, based in Germany. And the problem that they were having is, right, uh, there's lots of layers of the networking stack. And if you try to have a point solution for every single layer of the networking stack, when you're going to try to d debug that, you have a lot of conflicting things. As you're trying to upgrade and do the life cycle of things, it's causing a lot of problems because you have so many different components to worry about. And so they wanted to have just one piece of software managing their network that they would have to you know, debug, update, manage the whole life cycle of, instead of four or five different uh, pieces of software. Right? And so that's why they switched to Cilium, because Cilium was able to provide them multiple parts of the networking stack all in one solution, helping them reduce the complexity and the tech debt that they might encounter um, in, their, uh, in, in their cloud. The next example comes from uh, Rabobank, which is a big bank uh, here in Europe, or uh, in Europe where I live, sorry. Um, and their problem was they had one infrastructure team trying to manage the uh, 400 different development teams, right? And so they can't scale through people, they need to be able to scale through software and self-service automation, right? And so what they're able to do with uh, Cilium was empower the developers to make the choices about their network security uh, with guardrails, right? So they needed to scale through software rather than people, and this is the thing that Cilium solved for them. And they're actually able to migrate off their previous solution a lot faster through, because of the self-service automation and actually save them a lot of license fees too, right? So solving both a people challenge and a money challenge too. The next example comes from Ascend, which is a data management uh, company based here in the US. And right, they're managing their customers' data, and they need to encrypt data in transit. That's a strong regulatory requirement. And so Cilium became the killer feature that they needed because the network layer could just take care of the encryption. It's just one flag in Cilium to add encryption from, for node to node traffic. Right? So rather than having to implement this in Spark, which is actually killing a lot of the jobs that they were having, it was just one thing that they could add into Cilium, and it solved that whole thing for them. So they're having less of their jobs failing, right? So meeting both their customers' data protection requirements and also uh, providing a more efficient solution, too. The next one um, comes uh, from actually WSO2. Um, 
and this is around observability. And they needed observability on two aspects of the network. So the first one was around providing observability to their customers. So as they're running the applications on their platform, they needed to kind of see what was going on in terms of error count, request counts, latency, and different HTTP TTP status codes. They wanted to provide that so the application teams were able to observe their how their applications were doing and debug it as needed. And the second part was on the infrastructure side. They wanted to be able to see into the network traffic, find out the different issues that they had, and resolve them. And a lot of people love Hubble for this because it provides a very granular view into how network traffic actually flows through Cilium. And so Cilium provided them a solution to, for observability to both their customers and to the infrastructure team. Right? So this is the challenge that they are trying to overcome. Uh, the next example around multi-cluster comes from Secreti, which is a large bank in, uh, in Brazil. And the th thing that they're trying to do is they need to have a consistent networking experience across multiple clusters and across multiple clouds uh, because their uh, company had a multi-cloud strategy. And Cilium enabled them to seamlessly connect multiple clusters together and really deliver on the business, uh, that they, the business requirement that they had. Um, I'm actually really excited. This actually was just came out today. Um, this kind of like story is backed up by a lot of the end user ecosystem. So CNCF just launched their most recent tech radar. And in terms of multi-cluster management, Cilium was the highest rated project there. So once again, reflecting what, how people are actually using Cilium in production. So I think this is a great uh, testament to the project, right? So it's solving real world challenges that end users are having with Kubernetes, in this case, multi-cluster management. Uh, and then the last example is around a richer feature set. And this comes from uh, Meltwater. And the reason why they chose Cilium was because it set them up for the future. They knew Cilium has a great pace of development. Cilium is one of the fastest moving projects in the CNCF ecosystem. And they knew that Cilium is kind of like a platform that has many features to meet their requirements as they expand and change for their business. Cilium stretches from layer two and doing things like BGP announcements all the way up to layer seven um, and doing things like service mesh. And so what this do is it sets them up for the future and it has a rich feature set that they needed and would be able to meet the requirements for the future. Because people aren't buying into your technology. When I said they're trying to solve an immediate business challenge or need, but it's also about solving future challenges too. People don't wanna to have to continually replace and update, right, too. You need to have a story about where it's going for the future. And you need to be, you need to be able to tell people, yes, I can solve your immediate challenge, but I can also help you solve the challenges that you'll have in the future. If you think about kind of what I've been, all the things I've been talking about so far, none of these are kind of like individual challenges, um, or all of these are individual challenges, but businesses may not encounter them at the same rate. So a lot of cost, uh, um, companies might run into performance and scalability issues, right? But that might be because they're running multiple clusters, so they need to do multi-cluster management, and then they need observability into that. And then a new regulatory requirement come out might come out where they need to encrypt network traffic. But maybe not all these challenges will present themselves at once, and you can solve the first challenge, but also allow people to solve multiple challenge, set them up to solve challenges in the future, right? And so the thing is, once your project is already installed, it's very easy to enable additional features. And I think that's why a lot of people choose Cilium too, because it sets them up well for the future. They know that, yes, Cilium was very good at solving the immediate challenge that I had, and it'll also enable me to solve additional challenges in the future as my business requirements change, as our regulations change, as our compliance requirements changes, or as our business scales or, uh, or our needs change. Because ultimately, when we're talking about these low-level problems, you know, like encryption or network traffic, what that really comes down to is the bottom line of the business. There's a reason why all these challenges are there. Like, Performance and scalability is a great one. You have more customers than you expected, right? Uh, encryption of network traffic is a regulatory requirement, um, and it's 
required to be able to do business, right? And so solving these challenges are ultimately leading to the business outcomes. Um, the couple examples on here for Hubble for observability, um, going from hours of engineering time to debugging to seconds, Right, that's a very easy trade-off to explain to your CEO because it's a lot less expensive in terms of engineering time, right? And that's an actual business outcome you can point to and not just the technical challenge that you're solving, right? Or Cilium enabled us to acquire more sophisticated customers because we can meet new requirements that our customers had too, right? So when you're talking about like uh, um, high availability, doing like serving traffic across multiple clusters, right? A customer may need you to have like active, active uh, Kubernetes clusters, right? And so you can acquire new customers that you weren't able to before. Or if you improve your networking performance, right? Uh, that provides you a better way to compare to your competitors and uh, your customers may choose you because you have better performance, right? And all of these enable the business bottom line, right? The actual business outcome. We were talking about like, yes, you're solving a technical challenge, but that also connects back to the actual needs of the business and the bottom line of the profit and loss of the business. And so when you're thinking about how is my project gonna gain adoption, you wanna think about what is that initial technical challenge that I'm gonna solve that people are gonna be like, yes, that's the best solution for what I immediately need. You should be thinking about how am I gonna solve their future challenges and ultimately how does that connect back to the bottom line of the business because that's what all of us are trying to do with technology, right? It's not just, you know, it, it's fun to create a cool demo, but we also need to solve what the business needs because that's how we all continue to get paid and we like to be employed. So that's a little bit about um, how, what I've learned from Cilium. And now I'm gonna talk you through the process of creating all these case studies so that hopefully you can take some of this knowledge back into your own project and help increase adoption um, of it. So I'm gonna talk about creating compelling case studies as a cloud native project. So CNCF has a process, if you're part of the CNCF, um, it's laid out in the GitHub repo here. Um, and I'll kind of go through like how I did it, but ultimately we're submitting these to the CNCF um, in the format that, that you'll see on the website. So the first part is actually reaching out to the companies, uh, right? You need to actually have somebody who's willing to do the case study. And I've done this in multiple different ways. Uh, I check social media regularly for people that are using Cilium, and I ask them, hey, would you mind adding yourself to the user's file, or would you mind doing a case study with us? In our GitHub issue template, we actually ask um, people that are opening issues on our GitHub, hey, it looks like you're using Cilium. Would you mind adding yourself to the user's doc so that they identify themselves and we can actually know that. Otherwise, people are just downloading your software and using it and you don't know who they are. Uh, we also have an annual Cilium user survey and we ask people there if they'd be willing to do a case study. And also conferences are a great place to meet people too. Um, earlier this week, I was chair chairing Cilium and eBPF day and we had one, two, seven different end users talking about how they're using Cilium, right? So that's a lot of videos that we can do, and then I can reach out to them after the conference and be like, hey, would you be willing to do a blog post? Would you be willing to do a case study? That's a great way to meet new people too. So once you've connected with the companies and people are saying like, yes, like I'm, I'm happy to do that, the next part is doing the actual interview. And so the way I structure it is similar to the outline that I said before. So the first part is the challenge. What does your company do? So you can understand you know, the business needs that they're actually trying to meet. Like what is like, actually happening in your business? And what does your current IFT infrastructure look like? Okay? And then what was the challenge with that current setup that you were trying to look for something different? That's really what I was talking about at the beginning. What's the immediate need or challenge that you're trying to overcome that made you look for another solution? Because people choose new technologies when they have something that they can't overcome. Usually, if the status quo is fine, you're not gonna change it, right? Don't try to fix something that's not broken. But when something is broken, when you have a new challenge that you can't like, kind of overcome, that's when people start looking. Like, what was the actual thing that pushed you over the edge? The next part is the solution. So now that you realize you have this challenge and you need a new solution, what exactly were you looking for? And this dives into the things I was talking about before. Did you need multi-cluster management? Did you need better observability? Did you need network policy? Did you need encryption of your network traffic? 
What did you actually need in the solution that caused you to look for it? And then what made Cilium the best choice? Or insert the name of your project here. Um, and what other solutions do you look at? What were the comparisons that you can know? Like, what are your competitors out there in the open source ecosystem? Uh, and then in terms of the actual implementation, what does your solution look like? Where does Cilium come in? How did you insert it into your infrastructure? And that, what needs is it solving? And then how did you actually implement it? And then the last part is important too. Um, what is the actual impact that this has had on your business? What's the value that the solution provides you? And how did it make it a, your a situation for the better? How did it improve both the technical outcome and also how did it improve the business outcome too? Because that's what you want to be able to connect your project back to. It's not just, oh, I solved like network encryption. It's like, oh, I was able to solve new regulatory requirements that we continue to serve new customers or gain new customers or unlock a new market. What's the outcome for your business? And then finally, what do you plan to do next or in the future? So this sets you up to understand how your project should grow and develop in the future, right? So that it continues to stay relevant for what your end users are actually doing. Um, so those are the questions, but there's also a couple tips to that that I've kind of learned along doing this too. So the first one is make sure you record the interview. Uh, I do a lot of them over Zoom or now WebEx at, at Cisco. Um, so you can re-listen to the interview, kind of like understand all the different pieces. And it also helps you pull direct quotes because that's what ultimately people are going to see. Even if they don't read the whole case study, it's great to get some good quotes out of there. Um, the second part is use other sources of information if they're available. So if they've given a conference talk before, if there's a blog about it, make sure you pull in information from there too because that's a great place to get it too. And then the last one is like kind of how I think about constructing these case studies in a way that I understand it. It's kind of like a puzzle. You have all these different pieces from what they've said, maybe external sources, and you're trying to create a compelling story or narrative out of that. And so make sure you can think about like, yes, it's okay to rearrange all the different pieces to create a story that people understand so that as it, it, it flows as they read through it. Um, so that's kind of creating it. And then the next part is around promoting and leveraging your case studies too. Getting the word out, like you put a lot of effort into contacting the companies about interviewing, writing them all up. So how can we actually promote and leverage that so people see it and it's not just you know, something sitting on a website somewhere. So the first one is uh, social media and newsletters. These are really simple. I think probably most projects have like a social media accounts uh, on your preferred platform of choice. Uh, with Cilium, we also have a, a, a bi-weekly newsletter that we send out. Um, so this is a great way to say like, hey, this new thing is available. Um, uh, come check it out. And this is also a great place to, those direct quotes that I said before, um, this is a great place to pull in those direct quotes um, that we had. Then I heard this is a KubeCon talk, so I'm going to try to do a live demo um, of what this actually looks like right now. But Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, this is not a coding demo. This is just a regular demo <laughs> because I don't actually code. So yeah, we're mirroring now. And so the other place that we do it is on the project website, right? So your project website hopefully like gets a lot of traffic. Like where do we actually put these to promote and leverage them? Well, I go to the Cilium homepage right now. You can see there's some case studies right here of different companies. We say, hey, look, our project is used, being used by these different companies as social proof points. If I scroll a little bit further down, I can see all these different use cases pages, right? And this is like uh, different features that, um, that end users are going to be looking for. So we can click into one. So here's Cilium is a CNI, right? High performance uh, cloud native networking. And if I scroll down, we talk a little bit about what it does. And then at the bottom here, you can actually see we've integrated those case studies actually into the page. So people are like, oh, I'm looking for a CNI, or oh, I'm looking for something that does network policy. And as they scroll down, there's these social proof points of these great quotes that you've gotten from end users. So people are like, oh, companies like Azure, like Alibaba, like Google are using this. And so it's something I should consider too, right? And then as we go further down the page, there's other use cases. Um, and then we have some quotes from some of these customers too. Um, so we can see 
this is where, you, again, you can pull out the pull quotes from the actual case studies that you're doing and link into all the different case studies here. And this is actually where we have this users right at the top here. And this is where, at the beginning, where I said there's uh, 153 public companies and 74 of them are on here, right? You can see all the adopters. Um, so make sure you highlight this. Make sure that the information is easy to discover, too. Going across the top nav, we have the use cases that I showed you before, but then you also have industry vertical pages, too, because each industry has kind of like their own challenges that they're trying to overcome. So if we dive into, for example, the financial services page here, we can talk about, first words, regulatory oversight, right? This is financial services, highly regulated industry. Speak to the challenges that that industry is going to have. Uh, and then, once again, use things from the case study to highlight how your project is solving the challenges specific to those industries. And then you can feature different talks, the logos in the industry that are using it, more social proof points, and then guide them once again to the case studies that you have. Right? So as people are looking for, oh, how do I solve uh, network policy? Or how do I solve challenges in the financial services industry? You can point them directly to um, these examples and make it easy, easily discoverable. OK, so that's the end of my KubeCon live demo. Uh, let's see if I can make this go back. OK, that was my live demo done. Um, and the next one, so yeah, just kind of a summary for the website. Use the adopters page to showcase, showcase all the different users that you have. Add quotes to your homepage, right? Like, this company loves your project. This company is solving X problem with your project. This is a great place to highlight that. Um, add case studies to these use cases pages so people can see how it actually works in production. And then it's not just, you know, kind of like marketing stuff. Create industry vertical pages to show, once again, how you're solving spe industry-specific challenges. Yeah, and I guess just to summarize um, what we've kind of gone through so far. People are going to choose your project to solve an immediate problem or need that they have in their business. So make sure you make it super clear, what is your project the best at? What are the challenges that it can solve for end users today? And how can you make that clear to potential users? For example, through like the use cases pages or the financial uh, or, or through the industry vertical pages. Uh, the second part. Open source users have already benefited from the project, right? They're getting something for free. And so don't be afraid to ask them to do a case study in return. You know, 30 minutes in, for a highly performant uh, networking CNI that they're running in all their mission critical Kubernetes clusters, right? That's an easy ask to make. I would say in general, like my experience, people are very friendly. If you're already giving them something of value, you can ask for a little bit of that value back. So don't be afraid to ask people. And then finally, Make sure you focus on the business outcome and how your project is setting them up for the future, right? Because that's what people ultimately need to do. Like, they need to be able to convince their CTO, their CEO, hey, this is how this project is going to help our business, how it's going to help our bottom line, how it's going to help us gain more customers, how it's going to help us reduce our costs, right? Because that's what actually matters to a business in the end. You need to be able to connect the technical solution that you have to those actual business outcomes, too, and how you're setting them up to solve future business challenges, too. So with that, thank you for coming, and I'm open for any questions. Any questions? Yeah. You can just say it, and then I'll repeat it. Yeah, it's a mix. Um, definitely depends a lot on the company. Uh, obviously, smaller companies are a lot easier, and a lot of them like to get their name out. Um, but I think, as you can see, like we have a lot of uh, a variety of companies. I would say, like the bigger the company, though, the longer it's going to take, because there's going to be more people involved, more approvals, and stuff like that. But I think if you're not like I think you just have to be patient with like the bigger companies. Like some are ultimately going to say no, and you have to accept that. Like on ours, we've gone through the whole process. They're like, yeah, yeah, we can do it, no problem. Written up the whole thing, and they're like, no, we can't. And then you have to accept it, and then we just publish it. A user in the media industry, you know, 
and then it sucks a little bit, but that's the way it goes sometimes. But I've found in general, like people, it's kind of like the, you're getting, you're giving them a lot of value. So they're okay with giving some of that value back to you. Um, so that's why I said, don't be afraid to ask, because I've actually found it, like people are pretty open. Yeah. Uh, what exactly do you mean? I don't. Um, so the question is like, have we used like what people have posted in like Google Groups as like part of the case studies? Is that right? Um, I think previously we used some quotes from Twitter, <laughs> like before we had like these quotes from the case studies, um, but we found like eventually they were like a little bit older, um, and so we replaced them with quotes from the case studies because we had so many case studies, um, and so that was a little bit easier. But that's like that's a good place to start too. Like we also started with like quotes from Twitter as the original things on our homepage, and I think. I mean, it's already in public, so then it's, it's pretty easy. Like, it depends if it's like, I don't know, like a big bank and like they post it, then they're gonna like probably want approval and like, oh, don't use my thing. But if it's like, you know, somebody else like posting on Twitter, then it's, it's, it's usually pretty, uh, or a lot, a lot easier. But um, I think once you have like the public case studies, it's easy to like repackage and like leverage the content. Um, and even if you have a couple, then you can get a quote from each one, right? And it looks good. <clears throat> 